Hello and welcome to video number five, Habit One Be Proactive, Part Two. Uh, we're going to go right forward into from where we left off. We were talking about reactive and being proactive. Covey talked about the importance of uh, language in that respect, so I had some examples here to share with you. For example, you might say reactive, there's nothing I can do. But proactive would be, let's take a look at our alternatives. Reactive, that's the way I am. Proactive, I can be different. Reactive, he makes me mad. Proactive, I control my feelings. Reactive, they won't let me. Proactive, I can create an effective presentation. Let me stop there and give you an example. When I was applying to get a PhD at Arizona State University, uh, my grade point average for my MBA was, I think, 3.49, and it's supposed to be 3.5 or something like that to get into the PhD program. And so they did not let me into the program. Uh, and I came home and told my wife they won't let me in. She said, uh, we need to appeal this. So, so she first she called up and then she wrote a letter and she asked if I could uh, appeal the present uh, the decision. They says, well, you could make a presentation to our selection committee, uh, and that's not often done. My wife said, well, when can we do it? And so she made an appointment. I had just taken a personal sales class, and so I uh, put together a sales presentation explaining that while I was getting my MBA, I was working 70 hours a week and going to school three nights a week, and my wife was pregnant. Uh, and that they should let me in. And I had made financial arrangements so I wouldn't have to work 70 hours a week and I would do better. Well, they ended up letting me in on probation status that I had to have at least the 3.5 after the first year. I had a 3.7 or 8 or something and so then I went on to get my PhD. So I learned to not be reactive and to be proactive, which my wife was in that case. Reactive, I have to do it. Proactive, I choose a response. Reactive, I can't do it. Proactive, I choose not to do it, or I choose to do it. Reactive, I must. Proactive, I prefer, or I prefer not to. Reactive, I can't do math. Proactive, I don't like math. Reactive, how much money can I expect to make if I do X? Proactive, how much money do I want to make? And what will I do to earn it? Reactive. What's the meaning of life? Proactive. What is the meaning I wish to give to my life? So that leads us to the homework assignment that uh, you are to complete by the end of uh, the next module. It is listed as Habit 1, Homework 2. Uh, the second homework assignment, and it's to write down at least 10 reactive statements and then rewrite them into proactive. Now, this doesn't mean a negative statement and positive. It means something, a reactive statement where you don't have control, a proactive where you do. I'll give you the first one. I have to do this assignment. That's reactive, proactive. I choose to do this assignment. So do that, and you will submit that within Blackboard. There will be directions within the shell under Module 2. Okay, now we talked about language. What about behaviors? Let's talk about reactive versus proactive behaviors. Traffic jam. If you're in a traffic jam, you might honk your horn, yell, get mad, blood pressure goes up. That's reactive. Proactive, listen to some nice, relaxing classical music, read and ponder, and be thankful for the gift of extra time. Reactive, when a spouse criticizes you, criticize your spouse back get mad or pout, or maybe do all three. Proactive, maybe agree and ask why your spouse says that. Family camping trip gets rained out. Get mad, go home, and yell at each other. Proactive, go to Six Flags. So this really happened to me. I loaded all of my family into a van. We were going on a family camping trip. I stopped at the Food Lion to get... Uh, uh, marshmallows and graham crackers and Hershey bars for s'mores. 
when I started to come back to the van with all the family and the camping gear in it, I, it was a big thunderstorm, thunder and lightning. I ran for the van. I got inside. My wife had the radio on, and they said, continuing heavy thunderstorms all Friday night and, all, and Saturday morning. So much for a camping trip. Well, we asked, why did we want to go on a camping trip? And the kids said, we want to have fun as a family. I said, what else can we do to have fun? They came up with the idea of going to, back to Six Flags in Atlanta. So we drove back home, threw our camping gear out, changed what we were taking with us, and went to Six Flags. Most expensive camping trip ever, perhaps. A required class taught by a tough professor. Reactive, you can drop the class, change your major, switch uh, schools or resign yourself to a D. Or proactive, you can study harder or adjust your schedule. I once had a student come to me who was uh, going to take a biology class from a science professor who's now retired who was notoriously very tough and it was hard to get an A or a B in his class. And she was on a scholarship and she said, I don't know what to do. I don't think I'm going to pass the, the, the class. I took the first exam and I got 42. I said, gee, what happened? She says, I don't know. I said, did anybody get an A? She said, yeah, there's one or two students. And I says, well, how come they got an A and you didn't? They said, well, I think they're you know, pre-med majors or biology majors, and they just studied like 20 hours a week. And I said, why didn't you study 20 hours a week? She said, well, I've got a life. <laughs> so she can be proactive. She can either study harder or adjust her schedule, or she can resign herself to a D. Okay, so that's the example of behaviors. Here's another one. The wrong candidate gets elected. You can complain and call him names, or you can be proactive and get involved in politics so the right person gets elected next time. The new boss is a jerk. Reactive. Quit. Criticize. Complain or sabotage. Proactive. Work better and harder. You ever gone to Disney World or Disneyland? and there's a two-hour wait for a ride, reactive, complain, get mad, or just leave. Well, that happened to me and my family. I took all my kids. We had one room for the boys and one for the girls. I had seven children, remember. And we paid all that money to get there that we paid to get in, and we got in line for the ride, and it was like two-hour wait. I thought, this, is, this stinks. But uh, while we were in line, as you know, I like to tell corny jokes, and so I started cracking a few jokes. My sons, who were the oldest in the family, were teenagers, and they were a little bit embarrassed until they saw some cute teenage girls nearby who started giggling and laughing at my jokes. So they started cracking jokes. Then my wife said, why don't we do a sing-along? Let's all sing uh, Row, Row, Row Your Boat or something. And my sons, again, were embarrassed, but the young teenage girl said, that's a good idea, and so we started singing. Pretty soon, we uh, were having fun, didn't even realize it while we were waiting in line. So from then on, as soon as we, as we get in line for a new ride, we'd say, let's see how long it takes them to start singing and telling jokes. That's pretty proactive. So here's an example. What fits your busy schedule better? Exercising one hour a day, being proactive, or being dead 24 hours a day. That's being reactive. So one of the things where it's harder, hardest to be proactive is dealing with anger. Uh, it's a smoldering anger or short fuse. So smoldering anger is keeping it bottled up. It's kind of like a, a volcano that builds and builds and builds until it erupts. Uh, so the idea is to take some kind of action before it erupts into a firestorm or a major blow up. Douse it by learning to forgive the other person completely for the injustice. That's the best way uh, you can deal with it. Or a person may have what we call a short fuse. They seem to blow up to the slightest provocation. It's often due to the fact that they have this smoldering anger they haven't dealt with. The best remedy is to not get angry in the first place. Can you do that? Yes, if you're proactive, you can decide that you're not going to get angry. One thing to do is to use what I call pre-planned responses. So here's my example. Let's say that you're a young man and you're thinking about asking your girlfriend to marry you. So that's a touchy or important situation in advance. Now what she might answer, yes, I'll marry you, or she might answer no, or she might answer those dreaded words, let me think about it. Okay, so you anticipate that. If she says, let me think about it, how are you likely to react? 
you'll probably say something well like I want an answer right now and her response to your reaction would be something like well then the answer is no and you say well fine then forget it now you've broken up you wanted to marry her so if you're satisfied with things working out that way then just go ahead and quit worrying and do it but if you're not then think of a proactive response in advance to determine how you would, should respond. So when she says, I want to think about it, then say, I know this is an important decision, so take the time to make the right decision. To which she would say uh, something like, thank you for being so understanding and give you a big kiss. I wrote the script. So that's that w way it works out in advance. If you're satisfied with that, then quit worrying and do it. If you're not, then think, devise another proactive response. The idea is that you pre-plan how you're going to respond before you're in that touchy situation. Okay? So, here's an exercise you might try. What would you do if you have a high uh, a performance evaluation and you know your boss is highly critical, lacking in tact? A reactive response? Get mad and defend your position? Attack the boss? And then you get in a shouting match with the boss and get angry in a damaged relationship? Is it possible to be proactive? And what would happen if you were? I'm not going to give you a solution to this one yet. When we get to habit five, I'll actually bring the same situation up that really happened to me and how I resolved it using habit five. So here's a key. Being proactive helps you build character. You build character by being proactive when you feel like being reactive. Proactive muscles will get stronger when it's harder to be proactive. If you want to build physical muscles, you lift weights. You don't uh, lift a balloon because it's not hard. So if you want to be more proactive, you do it when it's hard to be uh, proactive. When you feel like being reactive, your proactivity muscles, if there is such a thing, uh, get stronger and it becomes easier to be proactive. So here's a saying to go along with that. People are like tea bags. You have to put them in hot water before you know how strong they are. Our greatest development maybe comes from how we spend our leisure time. So I'm going to tell you about a story. I went to Brigham Young University and we had a wrestling coach there. And he once gave a speech where he said that when he grew up, he was a wild young man. But he couldn't have been too wild. This is Provo, Utah, probably the driest uh, place and city in the, in the United States. But anyway, he was hanging around downtown, shooting pool, just kind of not going anywhere in life and not doing much. And as he was hanging around with his buddies downtown, uh, some girls that, he were, that they were interested in, him and his buddies saw walking by, and they went into a meeting. So because they were bored, they wandered into the meeting and followed the girls in. And the speaker of the meeting was the president of the university, George H. Brimhall. And he told the following story, which got this Roberts guy really interested. He said, you can't tell the character of a man by how he spends his time during his work day, but how he spends his leisure time. Consider, for example, the eagle. During the day, he builds his nest gathers food for the family. That's the work of an eagle. That's what he's supposed to do. But what does he do in his leisure time? He finds currents of air and he soars, improving his flying skills and having fun at the same time. So that's what he does in his spare time. On the other hand, he said, consider the hog. He spends his day eating, getting fat, because that's what pigs are supposed to do. In his leisure time, he finds the dirtiest, muddiest spot available and wallows in it to get cooled off, I suppose. So he said, which do you want to be? The eagle who soars or the pig who wallows in the mud? When Roberts heard this, he realized he was more like the pig. He wasn't going anywhere, wasn't doing anything. So he decided to turn his life around. He got involved in high school wrestling, was really good, got a college scholarship, and eventually became a wrestling coach at a major university. So you might ask yourself, do you want to be an eagle or a pig? how you spend your leisure time. That reminds me of another story uh, dealing with an eagle. It's the story of the chickens and the eagle. So the story goes about a city slicker, <laughs> a guy that was driving by a farm, and he looked around the farm, and he saw an eagle down here pecking around on the ground with the chickens. 
and he couldn't believe it. So he stopped his car and he talked to the farmer. He says, sir, what's that eagle doing on the ground like a chicken and hanging around with your chickens? And the farmer said, that's not an eagle. It's a chicken. The guy says, look, I may be a city slicker, but I can tell an eagle from a chicken. And the farmer says, you're wrong. He's a chicken. Look at him pecking on the ground. So the guy picks up the eagle, goes to the barn, climbs up into the hayloft, throws the eagle out so it'll have to fly. It flaps its wing a little bit, wings a little bit, comes down to the ground, starts pecking around like a chicken again. Farmer says, see, I told you it was a chicken. The guy says, nah, it's not. Let's let's do another test. So they grab the eagle and they get in the, his car, drive up on top of a mountain, a really high cliff, so he can't just float down, and he throws the eagle off of the cliff. The eagle gets scared and starts flapping his wings because he's scared, and pretty soon he's flying, and he's soaring, and he flies away and doesn't go back to be with the chickens. Nice story, huh? Well, what's the moral of the story? We're all eagles, not chickens. Or don't hang around with chickens doing chicken things. Or don't be chicken to be an eagle. <laughs> I kind of like that story anyway. Okay. So if you're doing the wrong things, just start doing the right things and stop doing the wrong things. If you're always getting into trouble in your relationships because you do the wrong things, you need to stop doing those things. Be proactive and do the right things. Either ask the other person what you're doing wrong or just listen to what they're probably already saying to you. So here is a video we're going to see, which will probably end this session. It's by a guy named Lynn G. Robbins, and it's a story called Be 100% Responsible. Number one, the distribution center. In 1983, a few partners and I started a new company which taught time management seminars and created and sold day planners. For corporate seminars, we sent our consultants to the client's headquarters where they taught at the corporate training facilities. Prior to the seminar, two employees in our distribution center would prepare and ship several boxes of training materials such as the day planner, binders and forms. Also included was a participant seminar guidebook of around 100 pages with quotes, fill in the blanks, graphs, illustrations. The two distribution center employees would normally send the seminar shipment about 10 days before the seminar. At the time the following incident occurred, we were teaching around 250 seminars each month. With so many seminar shipments, these two employees would often commit errors, such as not shipping sufficient quantities or omitting certain materials or not shipping on time. This became an irritating and often embarrassing frustration for the consultants. When these problems occurred, the seminar division would file a complaint with me, as the dis distribution center was one of my responsibilities. When I spoke to these two employees about errors and system improvements, they never wanted to accept responsibility for the errors. They would blame others, like saying, it's not our fault, the seminar division filled out the seminar supplies request form incorrectly and we sent the shipment exactly according to their specifications. It's their fault. You can't blame us. Or they might say, we shipped it on time, but the freight company delivered it late. You can't blame us. Or another excuse was the binder subsidiary packaged the individual seminar kits with errors and we shipped the kits as they were given to us. It's their fault. It seemed these two employees were never responsible for the errors, and so the errors continued. Then something critical happened. The director of training for a large multinational corporation attended one of our seminars and was so thrilled with it that she invited us to teach a pilot seminar to its 50 or so top executives. On the day of the seminar, our consultant arrived and opened the boxes of materials and discovered that the seminar guidebooks were missing. Without the seminar guidebook, how would the participants follow along and take notes? Their training director was panic-stricken. Our consultant did the best he could by making sure each participant was given a pad of paper on which to take notes throughout the day, and the seminar turned out reasonably well even without the guidebook. Extremely embarrassed and angry, their training director called our seminar division and said, you will never teach here again. How could you have made such an embarrassing and inexcusable error with our pilot seminar? 
An upset senior vice president of our seminar division called me and said, this is the last straw. We're about to lose a million dollar account because of the distribution center's errors. We simply can't tolerate any more errors. And as one of the owners of the company, I couldn't tolerate such errors either. But at the same time, I did not want to see these two breadwinners fired. After pondering possible solutions, I decided to implement an incentive system to motivate these two men to be more careful. For each seminar shipped correctly, they would receive one additional dollar or a possibility of an extra $250 each month, hopefully enough to focus their attention on quality. However, if they made one error, a $1 penalty wasn't much of a loss. I therefore decided to also include two $100 bonuses for no errors. With the first error, they not only lost $1, but the first $100 bonus. If they made a second error, they lost the second $100 bonus. I also told them, if there is an error, you will lose your bonus, regardless of where that error originates. You are 100% responsible for that shipment. Well, that's not fair, they responded. What happens if the seminar division fills out a seminar supply request form incorrectly and not knowing we send the shipment with their errors? I said, you will lose your bonus. You are 100% responsible for that shipment success. Well, that's not fair. What happens if we send the shipment on time, but the freight company delivers it late? I said, you will lose your bonus. You are 100% responsible. That's not fair. What happens if the binder division commits errors in prepackaging the individual seminar kits? You can't blame us for their mistakes. You will lose your bonus, I once again responded. You are 100% responsible for that shipment success. Do you understand? That isn't fair. Well, it may not seem fair, but that's life. You will lose your bonus. What I did was to eliminate the anti-responsibility list as an option for them. They now understood that they could no longer blame, make excuses, or justify errors even when they were right and it was someone else's fault. What happened next was fascinating to observe. When they would receive an order from the seminar division, they would call the seminar division up to review the form with them item by item. They took responsibility for correcting any errors committed by the seminar division. They began to read the freight company's documents to make sure the correct delivery date was entered. They began to mark the cardboard bo shipping boxes, one of seven, two of seven, etc., with the box contents written on the outside of the box. They began sending the shipment three or four days earlier than their previous routine. A few days before the seminar, they would call the client company to verify receipt of the shipment and the contents. If they somehow omitted any materials, they had three or four extra days now to send missing items by express shipment. Errors finally stopped, and they began to earn their bonus month after month. It was a life-changing experience for them to learn firsthand the power, control, and reward of being 100% responsible. What these two employees learned is that when they blamed someone else, they were surrendering control of the shipment success to others, the seminar division or the freight company, etc. They learned that excuses keep you from taking control of your life. They learned that it is self-defeating to blame, make excuses, or justify mistakes even when you are right. The moment you do any of these self-defeating things, you lose control over the positive outcomes you are seeking in life. Okay, so there you have it. Being proactive, being 100% responsible. So being proactive also builds your confidence and your ability to be proactive. This is a picture of a guy named Jeff Hornacek who played for the Utah Jazz in the NBA, and he set a team record of 37 straight free throws in 1994. And when people asked him how he was able to do that, he says, I was in the zone, and every time I made one, my confidence grew, and I knew I could make the next one, and it seemed like that goal was just as big as could be. So he, that's the way it is when you're proactive. 
when you are proactive, it increases your ability and your confidence so that you can be more proactive. Let me tell you about another guy. This guy is named Richard Eckersley. He set a free throw record in an Idaho high school basketball game. He was uh, driving down the court for a shot and he got fouled. And the guy who fouled him says, I'm not worried because you can't make free throws. And he said, yeah, I can. The guy said, no, you can't. I've been watching you before warming up and you can't make it. So he got up there and he's kind of tight and tense and he missed both free throws. The guy said, see, I told you you couldn't make it. Well, this went on and on. And every time he got the ball and got fouled, he got to the line and the guy looked at him and says, you can't make it. And he missed the free throw. He missed 18 straight free throws in one game, set a state record for a number of free throws lost. So if you're being reactive, uh, that can grow too, and your confidence can uh, be shattered, and it's harder to be proactive. So how can you be proactive? There's a guy named David Cheatham, who's considered a behavioralist, which is a school of thought in psychology, and he wrote a series of articles where he looked at the seven habits, and, he, and it's in High Performance Management Magazine. In this article, How Can You Be Proactive, a Behavioralist View, he takes on this idea of being proactive. So, if according to a behavioralist, you do what you do because of your environment or your situation, if you want to be proactive, then you change your environment, change your situation. The best way to change yourself is to change your world. Skinner says all behavior is caused by the environment. So, you modify or change your environment. What you need to do, do is understand the causes of your behavior. Change the causes and the consequences to change the behavior. For example, my wife tells me that I gain weight because I watch too much television and when I watch television I want to snack and snacking leads to gaining weight. So that's the cause. Quit watching so much TV or quit snacking and you will quit eating, you will quit gaining weight. If you turn off the alarm and oversleep, move the alarm across the room. I had a younger brother who would always turn off the alarm and go back to sleep and oversleep and be late. At one time, he put the alarm under his bed. The next morning, he woke up, and as he tried to get up, he banged his head because he had crawled under the bed, turned off the alarm cot, and still banged it. He never did uh, learn to be on time until he got married and his wife would wake him up. If you're overweight due to eating junk food, then buy only healthy food. If you criticize too much, avoid other persons who criticize. If you want to be more creative, hang out with people who challenge you. Another way to be more proactive is to make major commitments. Arrange rewards for keeping commitments and bad things for not doing them. And if possible, make those things outside of your own control beyond your control. For example, one man wanted to quit smoking. And so every time he was caught smoking by his friend, he, his friend would send a check that he'd sign in advance, that this guy who smoked signed in advance, to a political organization or cause that he disliked. After supporting disliked causes so much, he quit smoking. You ever thought about how Weight Watchers works? You have to report in to your weight each week. That's a reward. By, by telling how much weight you lost, or buy season tickets to the symphony to become more social and more cultured. Maybe you can get a success partner, someone that's interested in your success and will provide either positive or negative consequences for you. When I was teaching at a college in Nebraska, I wanted to get back into shape and I started jogging. So I asked a friend of mine, another uh, professor, uh, let's go over to the uh, gym in the morning. They had an indoor track because it's wintertime in Nebraska. And we'll jog go jogging before class. He said, great, I'll meet you at 7 a.m. Well, I showed up the next day and he didn't show up and I was already dressed, so I ran. I got back to the office. He said, did you run? I said, yeah, where were you? And he said, I'm sorry I didn't make it, but I'm proud of you. Well, he never did make it, but every day he would ask me, did you run and how much do you weigh? He became a success partner, rewarding me for my good behavior. So how important is habit one? Let's listen to Covey talk about it. When 
you think about the experiences that you've had with the habits, is there one that you're finding now that has had the most profound impact on your life and in terms of your teachings that may have more power than some of the others in terms of influencing your journey right now? Well, the foundation habit is to be proactive. Mm -hmm. That means all the other habits are based on that. And the key is the sequence between the private victory, the first three habits, and the interpersonal habits of the public victory. Politicians today, all they think about is their competition and not what is best for the American public. And that's the case in business, it's the case in most situations. Okay, so that's that. Now let's talk a little bit about <coughs> happiness and the effect that it has on others. This is a guy named Dennis Prager who says that happiness is a moral obligation. This is also a good lesson on being proactive. Most people think of happiness as essentially a selfish issue. I want to be happy, and I want to be happy for me. I'd like to suggest that, in fact, happiness is far, far more than a selfish desire. In fact, it is a moral obligation. I know that most people have never thought of happiness in this way. Neither did I, to tell the truth, for much of my life. I thought that happiness, and especially the pursuit of happiness, was all about oneself. But it isn't. Whether or not you're happy, and most importantly, whether or not you act happy, is about altruism, not selfishness, because it is about how we affect others' lives. And that's what makes it a moral issue. Ask anybody who was raised by an unhappy parent whether or not happiness is a moral issue, and I assure you the answer will be yes. It is no fun being raised by an unhappy parent, or being married to an unhappy person, or being the parent of an unhappy child, or working with an unhappy co-worker. Our happiness affects others profoundly. That's why happiness is a moral obligation. We are morally obligated to at least act as happy as possible even if we don't feel happy. People can't be guided by feelings because it is how we act that affects others, not how we feel. A good analogy to bad moods is bad breath. Why do we brush our teeth multiple times every day? It's not only because of hygiene, it's because we want to present good breath to anybody who we come into contact with. Well, the same thing holds true for our moods. A bad mood should be regarded exactly as we regard bad breath. Why are you inflicting it on me, or why am I inflicting it on you? It's just not right. That's why one should endeavor as much as possible to act as happy as possible as often as possible. And just about anyone can do this. No matter how unhappy you may feel at any given moment, you can and have to make a decision on how to act. We may not be free to control whether we feel sad or happy, but we are free to control whether or not we present a happy countenance to others. That doesn't mean we don't share how we feel with our best friends, including hopefully our spouse. Of course we can, and without overdoing it, we should. You know, I, I'm really sad. I had this problem at work today. I have this problem with my marriage. I have this problem with my kid. I have this problem with my parents. But you don't inflict a bad mood on anybody. That's a different thing altogether. We all have the capacity to control how we express ourselves, no matter how we feel. I can prove it. Imagine someone who is just acting miserably to his or her spouse. When somebody comes to the door, have you ever noticed how nicely such a person will treat the stranger? How are they able in a split second to go from inflicting their awful mood on their spouse to acting beautifully toward the stranger who's at the door? Obviously, we can control our moods. Or how about this? Let's say you are chronically in a bad mood and I offered you $10,000 a week not to be in a bad mood. Do you think this would affect your ability to be in a good mood? I suspect so. And to be honest, we even have the power to affect how we feel, not only how we act. Abraham Lincoln famously said, 
that we are as happy as we decide to be. That is exactly what we should decide. Being happier is good for us, and it is what we owe everybody who is in our lives. Becoming happier is another great benefit of acting happy. The happier we act, the happier we will feel. We think that our actions are determined by our feelings, but we have the power to achieve the opposite, to shape our feelings by our actions. How we act influences our feelings more than our feelings should ever be allowed to influence our behavior. So yes, indeed, we do have a moral obligation to be, or at least to act, happy. The happy make the world better, and the unhappy make it worse. Happiness is a huge issue. Lincoln was right. We are as happy as we decide to be. And it's time to make that decision. I'm Dennis Prager. So uh, I'm going to show you this video called Stone uh, a later time. I'll make it available for you in the classroom. It's about a man who was very proactive in spite of the fact that he was uh, injured playing soccer by someone else. So I'm going to make that available. I want you to view that on your own. And I'm going to end this video at this point and tell you that the journey continues. And that's the end of Habit 1. Thank you for watching.